Thank you for taking the time to uh, watch our podcast. You do not have to agree with me to be my friend, but um, no matter how unkind you are, no matter how hateful you are, you're not going to get me to be hateful toward you because, um, you know, I'm trying to represent the kindest, most caring man who ever lived, and that was the Lord Jesus Christ. And I don't understand where all of the hatred in Christianity comes from. I know where it comes from. It comes from the devil. I just don't understand how people who claim to follow Jesus can be some of the most hateful people on earth. It just doesn't uh, doesn't make sense. But anyway, we're glad you joined us. People are always talking about, it seems like, uh, a lot of people are always talking about the end times and uh, the Antichrist and the rapture and the beast of revelation and wars and rumors of wars and you if you listen carefully among evangelical groups, they're, they're not all united on uh, their belief system on this. A lot of churches are constantly talking about the rapture and how Christ is going to reign for a thousand years um, on this earth. But there are several evangelical groups that don't believe that at all. Uh, what the Baptists believe about uh, Christ's uh, kingdom and his reign is completely different than what most Presbyterian churches, for example, believe. Uh, the Catholic Church believes something completely different about the kingdom of God and, uh, and Israel in the place of God than, um, than the Methodists do. Um, so what we try to do here at this, uh, with our teaching opportunities, is to ask the question, what does the Bible teach? Is it as complicated as people make it? Once you have a system in place, a system that is supported by um, people's money, and you have to have that money coming in to keep that system going, then any time you stray from um, the party line on any particular topic, you're asking for trouble. So it's very hard to study the Bible independently and to, and to be honest with what the Scriptures ask, actually teach. When you are in a system that requires you to think a certain way and to believe a certain thing. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, let's, let's give an example. Uh, the 24th chapter of Matthew, I believe, is one of the most misunderstood chapters in the Bible. Uh, because in that uh, discussion, Jesus said that you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, famines and earthquakes. And uh, the people say that that has to do with the end of time and Christ's second coming. And so every time war breaks out or every time I've been hearing this since I was a kid, whenever war breaks out, you know, the Bible says there'll be wars and rumors of wars uh, before the end comes. Well, there's been wars and rumors of wars and famines and earthquakes and pestilences. All those things that he mentioned in Matthew 24, those things have been going on all throughout history, and they will continue to go on, and they have nothing to do with Christ's second coming. Now, let's break down Matthew 24 and see if that's correct. The, the, the chapter starts with Jesus at the temple in Jerusalem, and his disciples asked him about these magnificent uh, buildings. The structure of the temple was so uh, just magnificent to behold with the human eye. Jesus wasn't impressed. And they asked him about it, and he said, Do you see these buildings here? The time is coming when not, not one stone will be left upon another. In other words, these things are going to be torn down. And he was talking about the temple where people worshipped in Jerusalem. Well, that got his disciples' attention, and they said, When? When is this going to happen? And then he goes into a discussion and gives them signs of something to watch for. Uh, there was an important event that was going to happen, and he taught them how to be prepared for it. And here's how he did it. He said that you will see false Christs will arise and deceive many, even the elect, if that were possible. Uh, there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. You will hear, of, as we mentioned earlier, wars and rumors of wars. And then he says, but the end, of, the end is not yet when you see all of these th things taking place. But then he says, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. That's what Matthew's account says. Uh, Luke's account says, when you see Jerusalem encompassed by armies. That's what the abomination of desolation was. But anyway, he's talking practically. And if you'll keep this in mind, he's talking to his disciples. And he says, now you're going to hear of a lot of different things happening. Okay, what, what things, Lord? Famines, earthquakes, wars. That's, that's not the end. But when you see the abomination of desolation, now it's time to act. And the abomination of desolation was an attack on the city. And I know that because not only Luke gives us further information in his gospel, but notice what Jesus tells them after that. He says, look, if you're up on the roof and you see this, 
don't go down and, and get your clothes before you leave. And if you're out in the field, don't go back to the house to get your belongings. He says, just go. And woe to you if you are pregnant in that day. Um, pray that, that, that you're not pregnant during that time and pray that your flight be not on the Sabbath day. Um, now, let me ask you this question. If he's talking about the end of time, and if he's talking about the final coming of the Lord, what difference would it make if a woman is pregnant, for example? Or is he telling us to pray that Jesus doesn't come the final time? Or uh, th at the end of, you know, people talk about we're living in the last days. Is he saying pray that the last days don't come, or the last day doesn't come on the Sabbath? What difference would it make if he's talking about the end of time, whether it was the Sabbath or not? All right, let's give a different interpretation of this. What he's actually talking about is the destruction of the city of Jerusalem. It is a historical fact that in AD 70, the Romans turned against the city of Jerusalem and they came in general Titus destroyed it you don't even have to have a Bible to know this this is from the uh, this is from his history um, we know that Rome destroyed the city of Jerusalem in AD 70 now what I'm arguing is that's what Jesus is talking about in Matthew 24 the disciples asked him what about this temple Lord isn't this great and he said there's not one stone going to be left up on another it's going to be leveled that happened in AD 70 history will tell you that the Romans leveled the temple I'm saying one of the reasons we know Jesus is the Son of God is because he predicted that that was going to happen about 40 years before it actually happened. And so he said, when this does happen, when you see these Roman armies coming against Jerusalem, if you're out in the field, don't run back to get your stuff because they're not there to take a census. They're not there to shake your hand. They're coming to, to destroy the place. Get out of town. If you're up on the rooftop, don't go down inside the house to get anything. Get off that roof and run. And he says, it's going to be rough on pregnant women during that time. Why is it going to be rough on pregnant women? If he's talking about the end of time, it won't matter if you're pregnant or not. But if he's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem by a military power, then yes, it'll be difficult on pregnant women because they can't move as fast. I mean, they can't run as fast. They can't travel as fast. Um, when he says, pray that your flight be not on the Sabbath. In other words, pray that these things don't take place on the Sabbath day. You know what happened in Jerusalem on the Sabbath day? The gates of the city were closed. Hard to get out of Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. So he says, pray that this doesn't happen on the Sabbath day. These were practical reminders, practical advice. These were warnings concerning something that was going to happen militarily to the city of Jerusalem. And those who listened to Jesus and did what he said, um, they got out of town. In Matthew 24, until Jerusalem fell in AD 70, and I believe all the New Testament books were written before the fall, but a lot of people would disagree with me on that. But I do know that there was a great famine in Jerusalem. Jesus said there would be famines in various places before what I'm talking about happens. Well, there was a famine because Paul went around to the Gentile churches and took up money for the saints in Jerusalem because there was a great famine. In fact, all of, most of the verses in the New Testament that Paul wrote about giving that people applied to a Sunday assembly and putting money in a collection plate was actually talking about taking up money to help needy Christians during that very severe famine. In Galatians chapter 2, when Paul went up to Jerusalem and he had been appointed the apostle to the Gentiles and he met with the, the, the Jewish Christians there in Jerusalem, and told him about his ministry and told him about how God had opened the door to the Gentiles and God was using him to save non-Jews. And they said, well, we can't argue with the work of God. And they got together and they, they, they were on the same page when it comes to uh, the fact that in Christ, race doesn't matter. Now in Christ, we're all one. But they said to Paul, just remember the poor. And Paul said, that's the very thing I was I was determined to do. Now, why did they tell him to remember the poor? They weren't talking about the poor in general because that, that goes with Christianity. That goes with the territory. We're always supposed to be mindful of the poor. God has always said that. But they specifically told him, we, we're with you. You know, we, we, you know, we give you the right hand of fellowship. We're praying for you. We certainly accept your ministry, but don't forget the poor. What was he talking about? What were they talking about? They were talking about the poor Jews, Jewish Christians in Jerusalem who were suffering from that famine. In other words, Paul, when you go out to these Gentile churches, don't forget about your brethren here in Jerusalem who are suffering. And Paul didn't forget about them. He went around to the Gentile churches and he took up money and brought it back to help them because there was a great famine going on. Jesus had said in Matthew 24, there's going to be a famine. He said, about, what about earthquakes? Acts 16, there's an earthquake. Remember that when the jailer, the Philippian jailer had locked Paul and Silas up and, um, the Bible says that there was a, they were praying and singing hymns to God at midnight in Acts 16, verse 25, and then suddenly there was a great earthquake. 
and the whole prison was shaken, and the chains fell off the prisoners, and the jailer drew his sword and was about to fall on it. He was about to commit suicide because he thought, when he saw those chains laying on the ground, he thought he'd let his prisoners escape, and he knew that would have been a death sentence, so he was just going to go ahead and take care of it himself. Paul cried out, don't hurt yourself, we're still here. We didn't run away. And then they spoke the word of the Lord to him, and he, a Gentile, pagan, became a Christian. He heard one sermon. He went from knowing nothing about Jesus to being a Christian in one night. But it all happened because of an earthquake. Well, earthquakes today are not what Jesus was talking about in Matthew 24. The earthquakes that would precede the event he was talking about is... is um, like Acts 16, that's, that's the kind of thing he's talking about. Also, also notice in Acts 24 and verse 34, after he talks about the wars, rumors of wars, and the false Christs, and, and all of the, the, the famines, and the pestilences, and the earthquakes, and the tribulation, all of these things he says in verse 34, now all these things I've just mentioned will come upon this generation. Not our generation. We're not, we weren't there. He was talking about that generation that was living at that time. In other words, everything I've just told you is going to come upon this generation. So unless there's some people who are still alive 2,000 years later, it is not directly talking to us. He was talking to the people of the first century, and he was talking about the fall of Jerusalem. And then that led him into a discussion of, of the final coming, and we could talk about the second half of Matthew 24, where I believe he does talk about the, the end of time. But when he talks about the end of time, he says, of that day and hour, no one knows. And you know what has made Christianity look probably more foolish or as foolish in the eyes of the world as anything Christians have ever done is this constant date setting, this constant predicting. Jesus is coming soon. Oh, the time. Look at the signs of the times. Jesus is coming soon. Jesus is coming soon. You don't know when Jesus is coming because he said he didn't even know. Of that day and hour, no one knows. The son doesn't even know. Only the father knows. Now, that's biblical, but yet when I was a kid back in the, uh, in the 80s, I remember, people were talking about how Jesus was going to come soon. In fact, there was a book, I remember, like it was yesterday, that was a bestseller that was called 88 Reasons Why the Lord Will Return in 1988, and a guy got rich selling this book. I don't even remember who wrote it, uh, but uh, I just remember the title of that book and how everybody was talking about that book. Well, 1988 came and went. Jesus didn't return. What does that say to people who are in the world listening to us? They hear Christians selling books, making money, talking about how Jesus is soon to come and here are the signs of Jesus' return, and then he doesn't return. And uh, people are not stupid. They pay attention to that kind of stuff. And we need to stop trying to pretend that we know when Jesus is coming back because we don't know. Um, the Antichrist. How about that? When you heard people talk about the Antichrist and they say, well, you know, once the Antichrist gets here, we know that it's about to end. And did you know that during World War II, according to uh, evangelicals, Hitler was the Antichrist? That's what they preached back then. But then, of course, World War II ended and Hitler was taken out of the way. So he must not have been the Antichrist because he's irrelevant now. And then Khrushchev was the Antichrist. And then I remember when Saddam Hussein was the Antichrist. And then I even heard Pre President Obama was the Antichrist. And, uh, you know, all whoever uh, the, the enemy or the villain of the moment is, according to uh, these date setters and these so-called prophecy experts, uh, that's the Antichrist. Well, that's a bunch of foolishness, and it makes us look very foolish in the eyes. Not that we should be concerned with what people are saying about us if we're teaching the truth. If I take a stand for Jesus Christ and my love for Jesus Christ, people say whatever they want to. But if we're making God look foolish because we are just uh, misinterpreting the Bible so radically, then we need to stop doing that, okay? 1 John 2 and verse 18, John writes, My little children, it is the last hour. He wrote that 2,000 years ago. Okay, so 2,000 years ago, John said, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrist have come by which we know it is the last hour. Now, let's let the Bible interpret itself. Let's let the Bible teach us what the Antichrist is. John says that when he wrote his letter, some... 20 some odd centuries ago it was the last hour then and the antichrist was already in the world do you know why because anti means against so anyone who is against christ is an antichrist in fact he gives that definition in his very letter 
So the Antichrist is not one person that's going to arise and do all this, you know, um, all these, uh, you know, spectacular things that, that, that people have speculated on. The Antichrist is someone who is opposed to Christianity. And John had someone in mind and a group in mind in the first century. But isn't it interesting how he said in the first century when he wrote that letter, he said it is the last hour. So either the last hour has lasted 2,000 years or the last hour is talking about something different than what people today say that it's talking about. When John wrote his letter, it was the last hour. It was also the last days back then. You know, people talk today, we're living in the last days. We're living in the last days. But according to the Bible, the last days started in the first century. You remember it in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 1. God, who at various times and in different ways spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son. When Jesus came on the scene, it was the last days. Now, what does that, how could that be then? The world is still standing because the last days in the Bible does not mean the last days of planet Earth right before Jesus comes. It's talking about the last age. Um, the Old Testament predicted that someone was coming in the future talking about Jesus in multiple places. And that when he comes, he will be in charge. Moses will no longer be God's leader when Jesus comes. Deuteronomy 18 uh, deals with the fact that uh, you know, Moses told the Israelites that the Lord your God will raise up a prophet like me from among your midst. In other words, he'll be Jewish, and when he comes, you shall listen to him. Jeremiah 31, he says, the, the days are coming when God will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah. So the Old Testament was constantly looking towards something in the future. And when that something gets here, things were going to change. But now Jesus never said what Moses said. Jesus never said somebody other than me is coming in the future. When Jesus got here, that was it. That's the last days. The Christian age, the age of the church, Christianity is the last days. Because Jesus did not give signs for when he would return. And if we'd get out of that aspect of uh, theology and quit thinking that we know we, that uh, we figured out God's timetable for the end of the world, people would probably listen a lot more carefully to the things that we do need to be telling them about Christ and salvation.